During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Utah suffragists joined with national leaders to work for women's voting rights. Their activism and their example inspired leaders across the United States to continue to champion for women's suffrage. Utah women were some of the first in the nation to get the right to vote, and they gained it twice, first in 1870 and then again in 1896. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, often called Mormons, were some of the most outspoken voting rights activists. So why did Utah women get the right to vote twice? And what did voting rights mean to them? When Utah women began voting in 1870, many national reformers had hoped that women would somehow vote against polygamy, that they would use their political power to end that practice. Um, but as the years progressed, it became apparent that Utah women were not voting against Mormon church leaders or undermining political power in a way that would end polygamy. So reformers started to say that women needed to be taken out of the electorate. They started to say that women should not have the right to vote because they were voting for a system that oppressed them and degraded them, which was polygamy. Over the years, many anti-polygamy laws were proposed in Congress that would take women's right to vote away as part of other measures to end polygamy. And especially Mormon women had fought those. They had sent petitions back east, they had lobbied political leaders to protect their right to vote. But eventually Congress overruled that objection and passed a law in 1887 that took away all women's right to vote. As a territory, Utah had extended voting rights to women citizens in 1870, and that meant that many women had been exercising the right to vote for about 17 years before that was taken away by Congress. As statehood approached, women had been lobbying and parading and pressuring their political leaders to support women's suffrage, to declare their support in political party platforms, and to make sure that they would restore women's right to vote when they wrote Utah's state constitution. This was a big deal to Utah women because they wanted to be involved in state government and local government and national affairs. And they saw that a vote and the right to hold public office in, in addition was one of the best ways to have a say in their society. They wanted to make a difference both in politics, but in education, in the arts, in public health, and many other issues. But they saw political participation as the key to opening those possibilities for women. Losing the right to vote in 1887 actually galvanized many Utah women to join in the campaign to achieve statehood. They were determined to include women's voting rights in the future state constitution. Thousands of Utah women from urban and rural communities spent the next nine years campaigning with national suffrage leaders to regain the right to vote. The participation of Utah women from rural communities was so important to the suffrage movement here in Utah. It wasn't just the urban elite from Salt Lake City, the women who were wives of famous men or who had national access through newspapers and railroads and things like that to national leaders. There really was this grassroots movement of thousands of Utah women that when you take that together as an aggregate, it heavily influenced how Utah's statehood came to be and continues through today that shows what being a Utahn really means. Utah, just like the rest of the United States, has a legacy of strong women who helped to shape local and national politics. The women who campaigned for equal rights built a foundation for future generations to build on. Each of their stories demonstrates how one voice can make a difference. So Clara Ferguson was a young adult in the 1890s. She lived in Salt Lake City, and she was very active in the suffrage scene with her mother, Ellen, who was president of the Suffrage Association here in Salt Lake. She attended meetings with her mother and was active in the suffrage scene here in Salt Lake. Past statehood, she was actively involved in the political process as well. She was an advocate for the Democratic Party, and she campaigned for national candidates who came to Utah to try and get Utah's vote now that they could vote in national elections. And she went on even past that to become one of the first female sheriff's deputies in the nation here in Utah. Florence Allen grew up here in Utah, was a young girl in the 1890s. Her mother, Corinne, was in the Suffrage Association, and Florence remembers going to a meeting where Susan B. Anthony was here in Salt Lake and spoke, and she remembers how inspiring that was to be there with her mother at this meeting. And she went on, she later moved to Ohio. She was appointed to a federal appellate court as a judge, and she was the first woman to do so. So Utah really does have this really rich legacy of women's leadership that's really tied into women's suffrage and statehood. 
The road to equality did not end in 1896 when most Utah women gained the right to vote. Women remained underrepresented in local, state, and national politics. Women of color were excluded from public facilities, faced severe discrimination, and some could not vote. After Utah became a state in 1896, Utah's women of color continued to work toward equality for themselves and for Utah's diverse communities. For women of color, statehood advanced many rights, but it advanced them unevenly. So we see that although there were some rights on paper that were granted to everybody or to U.S. citizens, that left out large groups of people. For example, Native American women and men, or women and men from Asian countries who could not apply for or exercise the rights of citizenship. And this meant that especially for women of color, they continued to work after statehood to push against social and legal discrimination, to participate more fully in political life and public life, and to try to make our state live up to our ideals of equality for all. Years of hard work and persistence paid off. Utah women regained the right to vote when Utah became a state in 1896. Having voting rights on paper did not mean that all women in Utah suddenly had equal rights. Although after 1896, most Utah women could vote, very few women gained enough support to hold public office or to work in any job they chose. Women of color faced racial discrimination as well. Even today, on average, women do not earn the same amount of income as male colleagues. The victory of Utah suffragists in 1896 was just one step in a much longer journey toward equality for people of all races, ethnicities, and faiths in Utah, one that is still going on today. <laughs>